really a great pleasure this afternoon, at least uh, in Italy, this morning in the, in the United States, to attend the seminar of Professor Don Farmer. I knew him since many years. He was one of the pioneers of complex system theory, dynamic systems, and uh, uh, anything you could apply to theoretical biology. He was really one, really, of the first who uh, actually uh, explored this new field, uh, unfortunately, many years ago. But fortunately, we are still here, as we are saying before. Nowadays, uh, Doin has become one of renowned authority at international level on uh, problems concerning what is uh, usually synthesized in the word econophysics, but essentially he is um, uh, the director of the complexity economic program of uh, the Institute of New for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School, and he's also a professor, Bailey Gifford Professor of the Mathematical Institute of the University of Oxford, and he's extended professor at Santa Fe Institute. So he's covering very many academic positions, and this testifies that the importance of Doyne as an inspiring and uh, leading person in the world in this field. I think that we all of us will enjoy his nice seminar because I read the abstract and I'm pretty sure that it will be all of us interested to and learn that equilibrium is not what us physicists believe to be always the right equilibrium. Maybe in economics there is something else and probably not less interesting. So please join. It's your time. Thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. It's really an honor. Ah, anche a me. È un piacere es, uh, dare queste, questo seminario. E, uh, OK, I should share my screen here. And Marco, I share the one that says screen, right? Yeah, yeah, screen. Clicking on screen. All right. Is it, are you able to see my screen now? Yeah. OK, and now. Uh, I, I should have my the title of my talk there, and you see that? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm starting my clock, so I'll know what time it is. Okay. And uh, greetings to Matteo Marsili, who I saw, saw joining there, who's one of my colleagues in econophysics and, like me, a physicist who um, now does economics uh, for much of what he does. So the, the question I'm going to talk about today is, when do games and ec economies converge to equilibrium? And uh, it's, I think, a very important question in economics. It's a theoretical question. And let me just say, in choosing the, to the topic, I, I wrestled whether to talk about a lot of the things I'm doing now are very practical. Uh, so what I'm going to do is at the end, I'm going to come back and just say a little bit about those practical things. But I decided that for this audience of statistical physicists, I should talk about the work I've done that has the most statistical physics in it. And so this trying to address this question has involved at, at various points collaborations with people who have done some very nice statistical physics work. And um, so anyway, um, why does the economy change? Very important question. There's two fundamental theories about why the economy changes. One is that and this is the standard view by economists, is that the economy changes only because some fundamental factors from outside change. We, they receive what they call a shock, some noise from the environment, so to speak, and that then causes the economy to change. The other possibility is, of course, that there's some form of endogenous dynamics. There's some nonlinearities, there's some phenomena like chaos that spontaneously causes the economy to change. Now, just to go through this a little bit more, um, you know, in a standard theory, this was already spelled out by a guy named Vixel in uh, 1914, I believe. And uh, so he called our models are rocking horse economies. So that it's like a rocking horse. The economy sits at an equilibrium like the rocking horse would. The shock knocks it away from its equilibrium and then it moves back towards equilibrium. But as it's moving towards the equilibrium, another shock knocks it away. And so it's constantly being perturbed away from the equilibrium by noise. And then the job of economics is not to anticipate those shocks, 
but rather to understand once they hit, how will the economy respond to them? Just as in this case, if somebody was hitting the rocking chair occasionally with a stick, your job would be to understand the dynamics of the rocking chair to uh, understand how it's going to respond to those hits. I have to say, when I look at these models, I often feel like somebody is ramming a square peg into a round hole. Uh, one of the standard models that's used by central banks, for example, is called the smets vouders model. It's a fairly complicated model, has seven different kinds of shocks. Shocks are things like changes in labor productivity, changes in people's risk perception, new technologies, wages changing for some unknown reason, prices changing for unknown reasons, spending and monetary policy. So if you look at their explanation of how something like the financial crisis of 2008-2009 happened, they say, well, there is a bunch of these little shocks and somehow that causes the crisis. Doesn't seem very plausible. Um, but I guess, uh, and, and this is where I need, to, I need to make a little bit of a regression, a, a digression, to explain that equilibrium in economics is not like equilibrium in physics. So being at equilibrium in economics doesn't mean you can't have phenomena like chaos. And, and I'll come back and say more about what equilibrium in economics means. Um, but, you know, it turns out, while equilibrium models in economics can display chaos, it requires unusual parameters. You have to set things up for example, so the agents are very myopic and don't see the future very well. There is a famous theorem due to uh, a guy named Jose Schenkman from 1975 called the Turnpike Theorem that says that if the agents in the economy are sufficiently far uh, anticipating the future by thinking about the future rationally and looking into the future, then you cannot have chaos. The, the economy will settle to a fixed point. Um, but, you know, there are some models where you start turning the parameters, you start to see chaotic motion. Now, back circa 1990, some economists, including, again, uh, uh, Jose Schenkman, um, extended some tests that I was actually involved in creating in for chaos and applied them to a long time yeah, series. I think, I think so. I heard some sound was, is there a question or a problem? Okay, um, okay. They applied them to some long time series. They, they made a daily time series of the Dow Jones index. They applied it and they, they said, oh, we don't detect any chaos. And that kind of ended the interest of this in this in the mainstream of economics. But what they didn't really, or the, the community didn't understand is what they had really done it showed there was not low dimensional chaos. That doesn't mean there's not higher dimensional chaos. And given how noisy economic time series are, given the slow time scale, it's, it would have been shocking if, in my view, had they been able to detect any low dimensional chaos in a macroeconomic or, or even a financial time series. Um, so, I don't view this as a settled question, unlike mainstream economics, which sort of considered it back in the 90s and then rejected it. Um, now, uh, there's, there are reasons to imagine that um, chaos might be there in the economy and that there might be significant endogenous motion of the economy driven by it. First of all, you know, what causes endogenous motion. So I started my career in dynamical systems, and there's really only two kinds of dynamics generically that cause endogenous motion. One is motion on an end torus, and the other is chaos. And motion on an end torus means, roughly speaking, that you have cycles, and you have end cycles that have incommensurate frequencies, frequencies that are not rationally related to each other. And as a result, you you trace out motion on a torus. And, you know, you can get pretty complicated motion with on an end torus. Um, you know, if you take a bunch of oscillators and you start tuning them to enough different frequencies and you add them together, you can get some pretty uh, surprising things. But, but um, Ruel and Tokens showed that chaos is the generic outcome. That is, 
in, okay, in, admittedly in a special class of dynamical systems called Axiom A, but within Axiom A dynamical systems, um, which have special properties like structural stability, that you can show that they showed that if you go above two dimensions, N, N tori become non-generic, they become very unlikely. And so ab above a two torus, you get chaos as the only um, possibility. That had a big influence in pushing people to understand chaos as the explanation of turbulence. And, um, and the question is, does this apply to the economy? Um, it does suggest that if you have endogenous motion in the economy, it's either a low dimensional torus or it's, um, that is a limit cycle or a two torus, or it's chaos. Now, let me just put a star by that statement. Uh, I did write a paper with Bob Deisler back in 1992, where we pointed out that you can construct what we call deterministic noise amplifiers, where the deterministic attractor is a fixed point, but where once you have very much noise, the noise gets so amplified that you see things that can look a lot like chaos. There's also a recent paper by Paul Beaudry, a mainstream guy. He's actually one of the governors on the Bank of Canada. Um, Paul Beaudry and some colleagues where they take a standard macro model and they inject very strong strategic complementarities. And I'll come back and say more about that later. And they see limit cycles and they argue maybe the business cycles caused by limit cycles. But most of the time, economists are assuming um, uh, that the, the economy is settling into a fixed point. Now, now, why, since chaos is generic, you would think that it should be very likely. Of course, there are reasons why that might not happen. It could be that economic dynamics are really special due to something like the turnpike theorem, uh, so that it's just not going to happen. Um, and in fact, I'll come back to what this means exactly later. But um, if you believe people are rational and far sighted, then there's a good argument for that. Um, the other possibility is that there's just insufficient nonlinear driving. Now, I don't know exactly what I mean by that, but we know in turbulence that turbulence only happens when you drive the system away from equilibrium. And, you know, if you're not driving away from equilibrium, it settles to a fixed point. As soon as you start driving it away from equilibrium, though, you don't have to drive it away from equilibrium very much before you start getting chaotic motion. But maybe the economy just isn't driven away from equilibrium. That would be another possible explanation. Um, and, and one of the explanations I'm going to explore here is that perhaps rational expectations results like the turnpike theorem break down due to bounded rationality. We aren't perfectly rational. We can't see the future probably that well. And, and maybe that is what's going on. And now the problem is to investigate this question in the general class of economic models is hard because, well, what class would we pick? And um, all, the, all the models that exist have special properties. There's no generic framework in which you can just embed economic models. But for what I'm normal form games, there is such a generic framework and it's possible to just investigate generically what happens in normal form games. And that's what I'm going to do in this talk. That's where I'm going. So you may be asking, you may not know what a normal form game is. So let me explain. So in a normal form game, you have a table of payoffs. You have two players. The two players make them, or you could have multiple players, but let's start with two players. So imagine you have two players for now, and the two players make their moves simultaneously. So there's a point where the turn is revealed. We all each write our move down, and then we turn over the pieces of paper where our move is written down, and then we see what those moves are, and then we look up in the payoff matrix. We look up and see what the payoff is. So for example, I suspect everybody's played the game of rock, paper, scissors, where you all make a move. You have three possible moves. So hence there's three rows and columns in this table. And depending on which of the combinations you can either get, in this case, zero, it's a tie because you made the same move. Or as you know, um, uh, scissors, 
wins over paper and paper wins over rock and rock wins over scissors. Um, so, so a long time ago, this is now at least 15 years ago, I studied rock, paper, scissors. Now, and I'll come to that in a minute, but you might ask, what, how would an economist think about rock, paper, scissors? Well, they would think of it in terms of what's called a Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium is the concept that dominates game theory and it illustrates in a simple way the idea of what equilibrium means in economics. So a Nash equilibrium is a set of decisions such that no player can improve their expected payoff on their own. So you assume the players are rational, you assume they understand the game, they, they, um, a Nash equilibrium means that you're making a move that no other player can beat you um, by just changing their move if, if you make that move. Or actually, no, no other player can improve what they're doing by changing away from the move and the Nash equilibrium. And um, so what is the Nash equilibrium of rock, paper, scissors? Nash equilibrium is to flip a three-sided coin randomly and just do whatever that coin tells you to do. So if you just randomly choose with probabilities a third, rock, paper, or scissors, no one can win on average relative to that strategy. Now, it turns out you can't win either. Rock, paper, scissors is a bit of an unusual game, but um, it's in that sense, it's the most defensible move you can make. So an economist would have said, well, obviously everybody should just play a third, a third, a third. Now it turns out that's not how real people play the game. This goes back to Herb Simon in the 50s. Um, he argued, well, people use, we have limited reasoning capabilities. We um, use heuristics, rules of thumb, like, or we might use psychological reasoning about the other player. Uh, in fact, when I was studying rock, paper, scissors, I interviewed my son and he gave me a long discourse on how he played rock, paper, scissors with the other kids and depended on who the kid was. And anyway, a long explanation. Just to make a segue about rational expectations, it's a very important concept in economics. The idea is that a rational agent knows the correct probabilities of all possible events. So, you know, all possible events, you know their probabilities, you can take the expectation, you can sum over all those possibilities with their probabilities, you know the utility, that is how much you gain or lose in each possibility, and you choose the move under rational expectations that will give you the best outcome. Now, um, I kind of tricked you with this slide because of course in chess, even if you're Bobby Fischer, uh, first of all, Bobby Fischer was a bit nuts, but Bobby Fischer is not using rational expectations when he plays chess because even Bobby Fischer doesn't see into the future with perfect clarity. Chess is just too hard. And that's an important concept in this talk. Now, I want to pause just to tell a little joke. Um, the joke, the question is, um, how do two economists play chess? Uh, the answer is, well, they randomly choose black or white and then they argue whether black or white wins under the Nash equilibrium of chess. Because of course, if there were a Nash equilibrium for chess, in fact, there has to be, uh, uh, Nash proved that, we don't know what it is. And um, so, but if you know the Nash equilibrium, then all you have to do is just play that game. Uh, of course, there could be many Nash equilibrium, and and somehow for games like chess, the whole concept is not relevant. And that's in a sense, the point of the talk. Now you might ask, how do two physicists play chess? Well, they begin by getting quite drunk and then they move the pieces around the board at random and they argue about uh, how chess, whether chess becomes more or less interesting as you scale things like the number of squares on the board, or the dimensionality of the chessboard. And um, so being a, being a physicist, I'm going to uh, follow that strategy in my talk, although I, I'm not drunk at the moment. Now, as I said, even Bobby Fischer is not rational when he's playing chess. But on the other hand, even younger kids can be rational when they're playing a simpler game like tic-tac-toe. I discovered that myself uh, by, by, you know, when I was 10 years old, 
uh, tic-tac-toe, which I suspect many of you know how that how it's played. Tic-tac-toe was popular in my school. And um, and so we're having a lot of fun playing tic-tac-toe. And then I discovered a strategy whereby I could always get a draw, even if I was the second player making the O. And that meant nobody could beat me anymore. And my friends quickly discovered the same strategy. You can see I'm boasting a little bit. And so I had fun for about a, you know an hour. Well, until we all discovered that strategy. And after that, it was clear the game was just boring because we always tied, so we quit. We had discovered, we had been rational players. We discovered the Nash equilibrium. And so there are times where it's a relevant behavioral model. But if you're playing chess, Nash equilibrium is a, has no usefulness. And if you look at game theory, 99% of the work in game theory or more is about Nash equilibria or other forms of equilibria and rational players. Um, so, but now let, let me just give you a little example to show you where that can fail and, the, and another example of kind of situations where it fails. Keynes, uh, John Maynard Keynes was famous for what he called a beauty contest game. So he was talking about the stock market and in the stock market, he was saying the point is not if you're trying to make money in the stock market, isn't to pick the stock that, you know, um, is necessarily the best company, it's to pick the stock that others will think is the best. And actually, really what you want to do is that others in the future will decide is the best, and you want to do that before they decide that. So it's a, it's a, it's a game of the stock market is about anticipating what other people think, and he likened it to a beauty contest. In his day, the newspapers would chauvinistically publish pictures of six women, as you see here, and you would ask, the readers would be asked to vote for the woman they thought was most beautiful. But of course, the thoughtful person will go, it doesn't really matter who I think is most beautiful. It's the woman who others will think is the most beautiful because then whoever, whichever woman got the most votes, they would take all the people that had voted for her and they would draw a name out of the hat and then they would win, you know, a, a ocean a liner tour to Europe or, or to, in England to the United States or something like that. Um, now, so here's a beauty contest game th that gets to the spirit of that. So guess the number between zero and 100, that's two thirds of the average guess. So imagine yourself, imagine we were in a room as we would have been in the old days. And you know, there's 30 or 40 of you in the room. And I ask you to all pick a number between zero and 100. And the winner of the game is gonna be the one that's the closest to being two thirds of the average guest, guess. So think about it for a minute. What kind of guess is gonna win? Well, I learned I couldn't play this game in a room because people would do embarrassing things. Um, uh, let me just show you the outcome. This is the result of playing that game. A, a Danish newspaper played the game and um, they, I believe they had 19,000 respondents. And you see the votes that all the respondents made in this slide. And the first thing you'll notice is that actually there are quite a few people who made votes that were greater than two thirds. Well, if you think about it for a minute, let's go back to the game. Even if everybody in the room guesses is 100, uh, the winning guess would have been 66 or 67. So, that means somehow those people didn't really understand the contest, even though it was printed in a newspaper and they had lots of time to think about it before they mailed in their vote. So that says something. People can be kind of stupid or just not understand. Um, now then you see there's a spike at 50. So maybe people just go, okay, I'll just pick a number in the middle. Or maybe they thought, well, if everybody chose 100, then the winning guess would be two thirds and two thirds of two thirds is 50. So I'll guess 50. So there's a spike there. And then there's another big spike at um, one third. One third is two thirds of 50. And so if you're going through this sequential reasoning of trying to imagine how other peoples are gonna think, if everybody chooses the number at random, the average guess will be 50. Uh, and then two thirds of that is one third. So that's a very sensible guess. And then there's another big spike at 
um, that was the winner, which is at two thirds of two thirds, sorry, two thirds of a third, which is uh, two ninths. And no, sorry, one, uh, let me, I'm getting my numbers mixed up here. Yeah, two thirds of a third is two ninths. And so there's a big spike there. And that indeed is a winner. So somehow the people who won this game did it by iterating through possibilities and making a guess at how rational other people were going to be. Now, you'll notice there's also a spike at zero. If you're an economist, you would say, well, zero is the obvious guess because that's the Nash equilibrium of this game. Because just think about it, if we keep iterating the reasoning process and everybody's smart enough, we're going to land on zero. We're going to converge to zero. So somehow, this is just showing that the Nash equilibrium is not necessarily the right behavioral guess. Though, you know, the, the skeptical economy said, well, OK, but what if you played the game repeatedly? If you played it again and again, people understand that they always have to be two thirds of what everybody else is saying. So the answers will drift down and you will converge to the Nash equilibrium. True. So that suggests, well, maybe you're just generically going to converge to that Nash equilibrium, even if um, you don't get there in a one shot game. Yeah, oh, OK, let's investigate that. That's actually one of the main topics today. Is that the case or not? And so let's go back and look at rock, paper, scissors again. Uh, I, I did this some years ago and we used a reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, that looks like this. So we have players learn strategies based on actions that were successful in the past. So the, the move and the move here, when the move is characterized by this variable X, I mu, which is the probability that player mu takes action I. And then we have uh, what's called the attraction, Q mu I, which is the attraction of player mu to action I. And then if we know that, if you look at the top formula for X, it looks like a Gibbs uh, distribution. That is, we we take E to some parameter beta, which is like a temperature, an inverse temperature. And uh, we have this attraction. We're going to choose a random number, weighting the probabilities according to X I mu to make our game. And of course, we have the normalization in the denominator. And then what we do is we play sequentially and we update this attraction according to the equation below. And so you take the attraction QIA from the last period. You uh, mostly the next attraction will be that one, but then you add another uh, factor alpha that's an average over the, the expectations of the other players or, or the, the probability of the moves of the other players and the payoffs to see which move would have been most effective. And you keep weighting your probabilities to choose the moves that would have been the best moves. And even if you can't observe exactly the probabilities of your opponent, you can see what your opponent's playing. And so you can update your probabilities based on the frequency with which your opponent's playing a given move. So we use this now, this, this turns out to be, um, uh, it's called experience weighted attraction. It's um, something, uh, that's been tested in laboratories when people play games. It's a reasonable description of how real people actually play games. So we studied rock, paper, scissors under reinforcement learning. It turns out to make the game interesting, you have to bias it a little bit so that if there are ties, the tie isn't broken by zero, but it's broken uh, by some, one, one player or the other will get a little bit of a score. Um, and so we studied this and we showed that uh, that you can have a variety of things happen depending on initial conditions. We actually can show that this dynamics uh, here is equivalent to a Hamiltonian dynamical system with a four dimensional state space. And so depending on initial conditions, you get these KAM tori and you have a uh, random orbits that go around and occasionally diffuse through the KM tori. You see the Nash equilibrium at the center that corresponds to a third, a third, a third, or or the translation of a third, a third, a third, given the bias in the game. And um, you have these KM tori, but 
it's like something very familiar from statistical uh, uh, model, statistical physics models of, you know, where randomness comes from in Hamiltonian systems, the ergodic theorem. Um, now, so this is a nice, you know, this was published a while ago, which I think I have it on the paper here. Yeah, we published it in PNAS back in 2002, so 20 years ago. And, um, but this is not definitive for many reasons. First of all, it's just rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors is a special game. Um, we just studied that particular kind of learning dynamics. So there was a lot left to understand. So since then, uh, wrote, written a series of papers, this second paper in PNAS in 2011 and some others coming along later uh, with Tobias Gala in particular, James Sanders, and I'll be building towards a paper with Marco Pangalo, an Italian who was at University of Pisa and who you guys should invite to speak in this series. Uh, he's a very brilliant student of mine. So, um, OK, so I'm going to describe some of this work. So first of all, we decided rather than looking at an individual game, we would look at an ensemble of games. So we had to decide what that ensemble would be. Here we were we were inspired by some earlier work on Nash equilibria in in random games. And um, um, so we chose the ensemble to have the property where pi pi i j a and b is the payoff matrix. So that is in down here. The payoff matrix is that term in the lower right corner that determines how much the players get. So we chose the payoff matrices in the ensemble, so they satisfy a constraint, and the constraint is the expected value of the product of the payoffs is for player I and player J, or no, sorry, move I and move J for player A and player B is some number gamma divided by N, where N is the number of possible moves in the game, and gamma is just a number that you can set. Uh, and so if gamma is equal to minus one, for example, then the game is zero sum, meaning if one player wins, the other player loses. If gamma is equal zero, the payoffs of the two players are uncorrelated. If gamma is a positive number, then if I win, you're likely to win as well. Uh, and this turns out to be very important. So we then chose these payoffs. We, we, we constructed payoff matrices at random and studied the game. And we came up with a result that looks a little bit like this. So if alpha is a memory parameter, when alpha is zero, you remember everything from the past and you, you treat the infinite past just like you treat the present. As alpha becomes positive, it means that recent events are more important than distant events. And, um, and, and then gamma is the parameter on the X, on the Y axis. And so the phase diagram looks like what I'm showing here. Namely, when alpha is larger, you converge to a unique fixed point. And here we're holding the other parameters fixed. Just to go back to this, there's also a temperature parameter beta that we're going to just hold fixed for now. And um, so you converge to a unique fixed point in this yellow region below. You converge above that blue line, you converge to chaotic solutions when gamma is negative uh, and you converge when gamma is positive and you're in the orange region you converge to a fixed point but there can be many fixed points i mean there can literally be hundreds of fixed points and i forgot to say a very important thing about what tobias and i did in this we actually studied the game in the limit where the number of moves n is very large because that turned out to be analytically tractable and in particular, this blue line that you see in this figure here, separating the region of chaos and multiple fixed points from the uh, uh, laminar region below where you have a unique fixed point, that line could be analytically calculated using replica methods from statistical mechanics. So Tobias managed to calculate it and it works perfectly. Um, okay, and you can see already though that there's something a little bit like a transition to turbulence because you have a, what's like a laminar region on the lower right and you have the more chaotic or more um, nonlinear region on the upper left. And indeed, what you see when you're in, those, in the chaotic region, the blue region here, you see trajectories for the game that look like this. That is, you're in now 
an abstract strategy space where the quantities being plotted in this middle panel as a function of time are the probability that's assigned to a given strategy. In this particular case, there are 50 possible strategies, 50 possible moves the players can make. When I say strategy, I mean a move you can make, a pure move. Um, uh, so there's like 50 equivalents of rock, paper, scissors. Instead of being three, there's 50. And, and so this green line here is the probability with which one of those is being played as a function of time. And you see it's making little oscillations because the, there's an attractor where there's a, a, a limit cycle. And you see below two other randomly chosen strategies and you see those are oscillating too. And so what's happening is the players are, are chasing each other around the state space. One player starts to play, if you will, rock for a while and the other player goes, oh, well now I'll play paper more often. And then the other player says, okay, I'll play scissors more often and you keep they keep chasing each other around and if you uh change make some change in the parameters you see the parameters alpha and gamma below then something else happens and you see this chaotic attractor and um and but it's low dimensional i'll come back to how we figured that out and and as you change parameters you can get higher and higher dimensional Attractors. So in some cases, we saw chaotic attractors that had dimension of 65 and a half. The maximum dimension a chaotic attractor could have in the space was 98. So extremely chaotic, random looking motions. So we can get all of these behaviors. It's very rich. And we'd see fads. You'd see, particularly if you look like at the, the chaotic one there and you look at the Y axis, you can see there's periods where that green strategy is being played with a probability that's very close to one. There's other periods where it's being played with a probability that's 10 to the minus 30. So a strategy can be really popular for a while. When I say strategy, I mean a move, okay? Can be really popular for a while, and then it can become extremely unpopular for a long time, and then it can become popular again. So we saw fads in what the way the players played the game. And we saw other interesting things that were very generic, like clustered volatility. There would be periods where what the players would, would play would change a lot, and other periods where they would be relatively static. What we're plotting here is the change in the payoff to the two players uh, on each move. So we'd look at the how much did the payoff to each of the players move. And you'd see sometimes they move a lot, sometimes they don't move very much. It looks a lot like what you see when you look at, say, returns in a financial market. Now, then you might ask, what happens with more than two players? So, um, and so what happens with more than two players, because this was study was all done for two players, is that um, you get more and more chaos. The size of that chaotic zone becomes bigger and bigger. And particularly if you look at this diagram, if you see this blue line that separates the yellow from the blue and the orange, that line translates over to the right. So in contrast, where when alpha equals zero, there's only a tiny little, you know, one parameter, only alpha exactly zero gives you chaos. Once you have three players in the game, there's a whole swath, even when alpha equals zero, where you have chaos and the size of the chaotic region gets bigger. And the more players you add in the game, the bigger that region gets. So here you see this boundary that we can analytically compute growing. We're plotting this because we can analytically compute it. It's impossible, it's very difficult to compute this numerically with 100 players. Simulating a 100 player game is really hard, actually. Uh, and the parameter, by the way, that we're plotting down there is the ratio of alpha to beta, which acts like a Reynolds number in this system. Um, and here you see um, how the area, the size of the chaotic regime goes up as the number of players increases. Turns out it fits very uh, a square root, but it goes up and up and up. Now, I just want to point out that there's an analogy here to the ergodic hypothesis. That is, when chaos is high dimensional, we know from other things that the dynamics becomes really hard to learn. As if, if nobody, if you don't know the exact equation of motion, or you, 
then you cannot, uh, the amount of data that it would take to back out, to reverse engineer what's really going on in the dynamics in the strategy space, uh, it takes an exponentially large amount of data and, and the exponent depends on the dimensionality. And when the dimensionality is more than about three, uh, it's virtually impossible to gather enough data to get a good model of what's going on. And um, so the dynamics becomes unlearnable when the chaos in the dynamics is of high dimension. So it's a little, the analogy to the ergodic hypothesis, it's a bit uh, not precise, but is that, I mean, what's driving the ergodic hypothesis? Well, high dimensional chaos. We have high dimensional chaos, which is why as an approximation, the laws of statistical mechanics work. And similarly here, when the game acquires certain properties, and I'll tell you in a minute what those are, when the game acquires certain properties, we can have high dimensional dynamics. And when we're in a situation where the game is prone to creating high dimensional dynamics, the players are not going to be able to learn the game. and They're not gonna be able to behave rationally. Okay, so to, to just to say, you might've wondered how we were able to compute the dimension was 65. Well, it's because we knew the dynamics exactly. And so we could use compute Lyapunov exponents for the dynamics, compute something called the Lyapunov dimension and use that to estimate these dimensions that are across the top row here. If you only had the data, you can't do that anymore. Now, but you might say, well, okay, you studied one particular learning algorithm, and furthermore, you only studied it in the case where n is really large. Maybe when n gets small, things behave differently. You know, from the ergodic hypothesis, you sort of expect that's gonna be true, you know, the ergodic hypothesis works well when the dimension of the state space is Avogadro's number. It may not be as true when the dimension of the state space is two. In fact, in that case, there's no chaos, continuous uh, dynamics. When it's four, you start to see chaos, but you're not in the realm of statistical mechanics yet. But somehow as N goes up, nonlinearities go up, you start to be in the domain where you expect chaotic dynamics. Can we show something like the ergodic hypothesis for normal form games? And the answer is, yeah, sort of. And I'll explain here. So first of all, we looked at eight different learning algorithms. These were all learning algorithms that behavioral scientists had said, either people or populations in biology follow. But maybe four or five of the eight were ones that had been tested in um, psychology experiments. Um, and we came up with an explanation, I should say we, it's really Marco Pangalo, based on best replied games. And, and in a best reply game, what happens is the players take turns, like you get to move first, you make your move, I get to see what your move is, and then I get to move to make the best reply to the move that you just made. And then we go back and forth with each of us making the best reply to the last move. Um, and so, and you can get things you can generalize, by the way, this is just another one of the learning algorithms. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being a little confusing here. This is back to the eight learning algorithms. Then I'll come back to best reply. But we did things like level K learning. Level K learning, we use the same kind of reinforcement learning strategy, but each player models what the other player is doing and they assume the other player uh, does reasoning up to level K. And then the other player does reasoning up to some level K prime. Typically, most players will do it by assuming they're one step smarter than their opponent. And so you can also play strategies like that where the players are what an economist would call forward looking. They're really thinking about the future. They're being somewhat rational in planning their players, how, how they do this as were the, um, um, as they were in, in that game I showed you earlier. So we did all this. Now back to best replies, you know, in a, the best reply, then the game is a little, little bit like ping pong. You can look at a game, like this is a game with four possible moves, and you can see the payoff matrix there, and you can see the dynamics that you will fall into under best replies, because now a, there is a deterministic dynamics for the game that you can calculate. And so Marco and my other collaborator, uh, Torsten Heinrich, um, figured out how to reduce any game. You can take any game like the one on the left, 
with a general payoff matrix, and you can reduce it to the game on the right, where the payoffs are now either zero or one, but it has exactly the same best reply dynamics. And so once you reduce things to zero and one, now you can think of this as like binary choices in the payoff matrix. So you're now investigating a binary space, and then you can you can calculate using the microcanonical ensemble the frequency with which you expect to see either Nash equilibria, like the blue one shown in the lower right corner, where things converge to a specific value and stay there, or cycles like the red one in the upper left corner, where you just cycle around four different states in the state space, so you now have a limit cycle instead of this. And this, by the way, is under a completely deterministic situation. There's no more stochastic probability in the way the moves are being made and best reply dynamics. It's a deterministic dynamics in, this, in the learning space. And so then you can classify, exhaustively classify normal form games for when gamma equals zero. Turns out that had to be true to do this analytically just for reasons of, uh, of feasibility. Um, that you could exhaustively characterize the game and, and you can calculate analytically or quasi analytically the share of the best reply cycles by just counting the cycles and then then here what we do is we compare under some of these different learning algorithms reinforcement learning they're called fictitious play replicator dynamics ewa ewa with noise level k ewa means experience weighted attraction that's the algorithm i've showed you earlier and you can look at what happens if you just generate the ensemble by generating Gaussian numbers for the payoff matrix. And by the way, you can make a maximum entropy argument to argue that Gaussian numbers are the right numbers to use uh, for the ensemble we chose. Uh, and, um, and, or best reply dynamics, and, and, and you compare there the frequency of non-convergence under each of those algorithms to the frequency of non-convergence meaning non-convergence to equilibria, you would expect from doing the best reply dynamics. And you can see the correlation is not perfect, but it's pretty good. And for, for EWA, for example, it's very good. And, um, uh, and so then we could analytically predict what was gonna happen. And what we saw is just as a segue before I, I, I show you the result, best reply structure provides a kind of skeleton so you see these orbits from best reply dynamics and very often when you actually run the learning algorithm you see that the that skeleton kind of organizes what happens so i'm not going to go into that in detail here but i'll just show you the final result so what we're doing here is we're looking at on the left the number of actions n and on the right the payoff correlation gamma and we, um, on the vertical axis, you have the share of the best re reply cycles, so uh, which would be the dashed line. So that's the theoretical prediction. And you can see when, that when the number of actions is small, so let's say start with, um, let's start with the upper left. In the upper left, you see that our prediction is that when N is small, uh, there's, convergence is a relatively common thing, but as n gets up to about five or six already, the overwhelming fraction of the time we see chaotic dynamics and we don't see convergence anymore. That's the prediction. And then you look at, can look at all of the different learning algorithms listed above with the symbols, and you can see that with one exception, which is fictitious play, the best reply dynamics does a pretty good job of uh, predicting the convergence frequency and predicts that in the limit where you have a lot of um, a lot of possible moves, chaos becomes overwhelmingly likely. And then you can see similarly the prediction when gamma is zero, and you can see the prediction when gamma is 0.7. When gamma becomes large, in contrast, we now predict that you're not going to see a lot of chaos except for the case of replicator dynamics. And we have explanations for why those don't follow the rules. Um, you also see on the right how things vary as a function of the payoff correlation gamma. And you can see that as gamma goes up, the frequency of chaotic 
behavior goes down. And, and so kind of understand the lay of the land generically for normal form games. And the outcome is that equilibrium is unlikely when games are complicated and competitive. That is, if there's more than two players, there's more than a few possible actions and the incentives aren't lined up, then it's very unlikely that Nash Equilibrium is going to provide a good explanation of how a real person will play this game with some underbounded rationality. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, these conditions correspond to a lot of the conditions that are common. If you're playing the stock market, it's a game of more than two players. There's lots of possible actions and your incentives are not lined up with those of the other players. Um, there are other things, if, if you start going beyond normal form games, you then get into games that can have dynamics in them. Stability becomes very important and the space of things that can be chaotic <coughs> becomes even more likely as a result. Um, I want to just stress that chaotic solutions are not equilibrium. Outcome, and that's because to an economist, outcomes don't match expectations. At equilibrium in economics, <coughs> all the players are rational enough that they that the outcomes of the of the game match what the expectations of the players have. So the players might not be rational, but however the setup, the outcomes match their expectations. That's not true in these chaotic solutions. Now, let me see how much time I have. I want to leave time for questions. I'm it's almost 50 minutes. I'm going to spend maybe two or three minutes going through a few more slides and then I'm going to lay things open for questions. I was going to show you just a few models. This is a model. So we took a standard model in macroeconomics and we perturbed it. <coughs> Instead of assuming a single household is rational, which then keeps you at a fixed point. It's a very famous model uh, in macroeconomics called the uh, RCK model. Um, we assume that, um, uh, and so in this model, let me just say a little more about it. You have a single household. The single household is the sole owner of a single firm. The household decides how much to invest in that firm to make more goods versus how much to consume. So the household makes, the key decision the household makes is how much to save. And you can calculate the decision the household should make in order to maximize the wealth in the economy. And that's called the golden mean. And so we instead said, well, let's suppose the households are just dumb. They can't calculate anything. All they do is they have a social network at intermittent intervals. We, they wake up, they look around at all their neighbors and they choose the neighbor who is consuming the most at that point in time. They choose that neighbor's savings rate. They adopt it as their own. And until they wake up again, and well, they will wake up periodically according to some Poisson number, they maintain that savings rate. And that's all they do. That's all the reasoning they do. But there's a network of households now. It's a heterogeneous system. The answer we get for what happens can be summarized in this graph. So we have tau across the bottom, which is the interval between when they wake up. We have the saving possible savings rates between zero and one at the top. And <clears throat> we see that when tau is small, where they're waking up all the time, you get caught in a poverty trap where they save very little the households are very poor and that's it. Then as you increase tau, so this is, and, and the colors here are showing the states the system visited, the savings rates that were in the population at each value of tau uh, over runs that went on for a long time. They, they stay at this fixed point, but the fixed point starts to move up as you see this um, solid blue line. Um, the households start to become wealthier. They're making a decision that's much closer to that of the rational agent, which is shown in white. And then it seems like, despite the fact that these households are not thinking, they somehow are making the optimal decision. And just when they start to do that, there's a bifurcation and you start seeing an oscillation where households oscillate between making high savings rates and low savings rates. So that's the region on the right now where this, this um, uh, social evaluation time has gotten longer and now they oscillate and you now have an oscillation in the economy uh, seen for individual households above business cycles in the middle panel 
sorry, the capital that's in being invested in the middle panel or the aggregate output of the economy in the lower panel, um, you now see oscillations in that. You see something that looks like an endogenous business cycle emerging spontaneously from this model. And while there's a little bit of noise in the model, the dynamics are not just driven by that noise. And OK, so I, I won't say more about it. Let me just say we also had a model of lever what are called leverage cycles. And this goes back to a remark I'll make before I close. Uh, in the economy, you might ask, what's the equivalent of the Reynolds number? What's the equivalent of forcing that drives the system away? And one of the factors clearly is leverage. That is our ability to borrow money. Borrowing money drives is a nonlinear force driving the system away from equilibrium. We illustrated that in this model for the crisis of 2008, uh, but I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm gonna just go through the slides just to say for in both the financial system and the uh, macro economy, we show how business cycles naturally emerge under bounded rationality without the need for external shocks. The analogy I make is to balancing a pole. I don't know if you've ever tried to balance a long pole. Turns out you can do this as long as the pole's at least a meter long. I did a calculation, by the way, you can treat the pole like a pendulum. You can see that around one meter, there is, there is a transition of you, your reactions being good enough to maintain the pole vertical. But you can never maintain the pole perfectly vertical. Um, and the pole will make little oscillations. So what explains those oscillations? Well, if you were an economist and you had a rocking horse model of the type I said, you'd say, well, it's because there must be some wind in the room that's kicking the pole. The, the pole balancer will approximate the pole balancer is a perfect pole balancer who, if the room were still, can hold that pole completely vertical. But actually, in reality, we know what happens is that it happens even in a perfectly still room. The problem is we're imperfect pole balancers. We have lags in our responses. We don't respond perfectly. We overshoot. And as a result, and, and a pole has some natural frequency of oscillation, and those two things come together to make the pole oscillate. I argue that's what's really causing business cycles and other dynamics in the economy. I can come back and say more about that financial model if there are questions about it, but I wanna just end up by saying, I've been devoting my career to doing economics in a very different way than the way it's done. Questioning assumptions that are 150 years old in economics, I all my models have no utility functions, no rational agents, no perfect maximizers, so I've thrown out everything that happened in 20th century economics and afterwards. And uh, I've got many examples now where these kind of things come into play. And let me just close by saying, if anybody's interested, I could say a little bit about some of the more practical things I'm doing where these kind of dynamics become important. And on that, I'd like to uh, end. And let me see, uh, maybe I'll stop. Well, maybe people can ask me questions now. Yeah, are you guys there? I hope. Questions? Yes. yes. Okay. Everybody? Let's say. So I'm not hearing, am I not? Nobody has any questions or I'm just not hearing them? Rosario, <laughs> you have, you're on mute, yeah. Rosario. Hi, hi, Doreen. Just, uh, I mean, you concluded your 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 talk with uh, with the point that uh, all your models are without uh, not uh, in in economics. So let's say, not considering equilibrium, but rather, uh, let's say, deviation or just a non-equilibrium systems. But on the other end, I mean, it is. Uh, also very important to say that uh, when you when you start an idealization of a model the equilibrium state uh, should be the simplest one right or you think that that economics is really intrinsically out of equilibrium that i mean an equilibrium could not be fault for a, an economic system no i i let me let me be be clear i think both are true i think 
the 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 study that I showed led by Marco Pengalo, where we exhaustively characterize normal form games, we're not saying they never go to equilibrium. You know, I had my example of the little kids playing tic-tac-toe. There they find the equilibrium. So given some time in a, in a simple setup or a setup that's not competitive, players will find an equilibrium. It's when those conditions are violated that they don't. And the problem is that essentially all of economics assumes equilibrium. And so they're using equilibrium even when it's inappropriate. So it's like, remember I showed you these pictures of these chaotic attractors, which is the, the, the you know, the, the strategies of the players moving around in a strategy space, it's like approximating that chaotic attractor by a fixed point, by one point in that space. It might be in the center or it might not be. You know, it might, it might not even be included in that set. And so it's just a very bad, can be an extremely bad approximation and it misses the main point. And that's why, you know, unfortunately, it means that if we want to understand real economic situations where that's going on, we have to make agent-based models where we really try and realistically model the dynamics rather than using the shortcut of jumping to equilibrium, which of course simplifies the analysis a lot. But we, we can't make that shortcut. It's not a productive shortcut when the conditions are met that drives the economy out of equilibrium. So, I'm, so that's one point. And let me just make, because that's a great question. Let me make another related point that I'm making at the end. I also question the whole framework. You know, economics is set up saying that agents are selfish utility maximizers, that the economic solution corresponds to the one where the agents have all selfishly maximized their utility under the beliefs they have about the world. So even if you throw out rational expectations, they're still hanging on to utility maximization and, and optimization. And I just don't, I mean, there's a lot of psychological evidence that suggests that's yeah. not a good model for what we do. So that's a second point on top yeah. of the first point. I, and Thank in you, fact, I mean, if I can uh, ask uh, an, another little question concerning, I mean, in, in several models, also in, in, in some of your models, you have heterogeneity. But typically, at least from my experience in, in uh, uh, economics and financial models, heterogeneity is it, it, something ubiquitous. Do you think that this is something, uh, uh, let's say, essential in the modeling of, of the economic system or not? Yeah, I do think it's essential. We saw, you know, it, with the model I briefly mentioned at the beginning, at the end, uh, there were two key ingredients. We made the model heterogeneous and we made the players boundedly rational. And those are generic things. Now, there are situations where you don't need to deal with those things, you know, because um, uh, whether heterogeneity matters depends on the way the dynamics are aggregating. If the system's sufficiently linear, then an average of the player's behavior may be perfectly fine for understanding what's going on. And you may not need to deal with heterogeneity. But if the interactions are sufficiently nonlinear, that's going to be a bad approximation. Now, let me just say the economists are well aware of both of these points. So there's a lot of work now on, um, on, on heterogeneity. There's a class of models in macroeconomics called Hank models, heterogeneous agent neo uh, Keynesian uh, macro models. And um, so now, but the problem is because they're doing all this optimization, they have to put in very stylized assumptions about the heterogeneity because to keep the model and to keep the model tractable. And they just put in heterogeneity of households. They don't put heterogeneity of industries. There are other models that have heterogeneous industries, but don't have heterogeneous households because the machinery is so hard to make fit in these standard models. So the economists are thinking about that. They're also thinking about bounded rationality. They, they put in things that involve agents that are myopic. So, but it's always generalizing away from existing models a step at a time. And in my view, it still isn't going far enough. And because these models, once you try and deal with rationality, rationality, when the situation gets complicated, computing what the rational player would do, as in chess, becomes so difficult that it's impossible. And so that means you're just ruling out this whole class of models that are realistic because you can't compute them. You can't deal with them. And on the other hand, if you use 
heuristics and agent-based models, you can deal with those things. So that's the big reason why we need to move in that direction. Sorry for the long answer, but it was such a good question that I, I think it's in a sense, most essential point. I'm seeing Matteo's picture there too. Mateo, yeah, you're... so I, have a question. I also have a question, so which is a little bit more technical. So, uh, so you find this chaotic regime when uh, the payoffs are anti-correlated one to the other, and when uh, uh, the say alpha is very small. So alpha being very small means that uh, uh, the, uh, the the agents take averages uh, of payoff over a very long time, right? So yeah. when alpha goes to zero, essentially the agents are essentially taking uh, an expectation, uh, true expectation value on the dynamics. So, so I would expect, uh, I mean, uh, this is a little bit uh, counterintuitive, no? Because yeah, the longer agents take average, the more smooth uh, the dynamics should be. And if yeah. uh, agents take, uh, do not take average, uh, average over only few times, that, then the dynamics should be very noisy. So can yeah. you to that? I mean, is there some understanding of? Uh, yeah, I can try. Uh, and this puzzled me too for a long time. And Marco figured this out. The answer is that when the players have less memory, it becomes easier for them to coordinate. Because they, the other player, you know, you're seeing what well, the other player does something, you can coordinate with the other player and lock on to a fixed point more easily and keep in mind that there's a big strong noise component going on in the background. So I didn't say much about the beta parameter, but when the beta parameter gets large, so you have, uh, sorry, uh, no, when the beta parameter gets small, corresponding to the temperature being high, okay, then, then the dynamics are extremely noisy. So regardless of what the players are doing, I mean, if, if, if the noise is really big, the players are just going to randomly choose the possibilities and they're going to quickly converge on, they're immediately converging on a fixed point because both players are playing the same thing, thing every time because of the noisy background. And if you think about, you, when you look at it, what you'll see is that the central thing is the ratio of beta and alpha. And so uh, when alpha is going to zero, the uh, and when the noise is sufficiently low, then you are, I'm not giving you a very clear answer. You're more able to converge to the equilibrium. So um, I'm not sure I fully answered your question, Matteo. But let me, let me make a, one broader comment. The broader comment is, is that the most relevant one for human behavior is when, is when beta is reasonably large so that the, um, Dynamics, so the no, the temperature is is there's there is some non-zero temperature, but the temperature is not not really large, and and in that and and you know and the most reason important region for players then would be alpha is probably not zero, but it's close to zero, and uh, in the other study that we did where we exhaustively studied things, that's the regime that we exhaustively studied because that's the most relevant one for behavior. OK, thanks. Yeah, I, I didn't fully answer your question. I, should, I, I need to make sure I prepped on that one because people often ask me that and I haven't I haven't given this talk in a long I mean, time. We addressed this issue a long time ago in the minority game and also yeah. it's very non-trivial because essentially the parameter beta, which looks like uh, at inverse temperature at the collective scale, behaves like a temperature. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is actually at low beta, you get a very sort of deterministic dynamics. Huh? Mm -hmm. But we were studying the case where alpha is equal to is, is essentially equal to zero. So, uh -huh. so where, yeah, so I think it's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, 
I have probably a stupid question, but uh, I'm really curious. Those are always the best. To ask uh, to Darwin, um, uh, taking into account this kind of modeling, which it seems quite plausible from many point of view, uh, did, is there any way to understand how uh, certain behaviors that escape the expected rationality can drive a system towards a sort of meta state where uh, you see you, you you create a sort of fictitious po fixed point or equilibrium point in such a way to produce a very big driving perturbation force and if there is any way to uh, quantify such a situation in these models let me make sure I understand your question, Roberto. So you're asking, are there some kind of metastable states? Yeah. That maybe a system can get trapped in for a while. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so this, the, the analogy to that would be um, a Nash equilibrium in, in game theory. You can, games can have many Nash equilibria. They can have, in fact, I should say in the games and we studied, when, when things get large, you can have hundreds of Nash equilibria, thousands of them even. But, you know, you can certainly often have two. And when you have more than one, well, which, how are you going to choose which one is the one that's selected? So there's a whole literature in economics and game theory of how does, how does the equilibrium get picked. One equilibrium can have be much better equilibrium for everybody to be in than the other. But, but you, if you're all rational, once you get to one, you're stuck in it possibly forever. And so that is like the metastability you're talking about. This is something economists have thought about a lot. They've yeah. worried a lot about multiple equilibria. But there is any way, for instance, in, to, in the model to introduce uh, actions that may drive the system in a very rational behavior and then produce some big perturbation. Yeah, well, actually, uh, in the model, the macro model I showed you, uh, to yeah. give you a little background history. And the original version of the model, uh, you know, we submitted to PNAS, it, uh, got, by the way, got published just this year. We submitted it to PNAS and they reviewed it, two economists reviewed it, and, and they said, well, you know, it looks, looks good, but, um, but the frequencies for the business cycles are much too long. In reality, a business cycle has a frequency of the order of 10 years and you're getting frequencies or, or periods of you know 50 years or more, so it's too long. So it doesn't look like this could be a business cycle. It makes the paper less interesting. Um, and then one of them said, "Well, I wonder what would happen if you had some rational players too." So it turns out we started exploring the parameter space more exhaustively, and then we said, "Well, let's put in the rational players." And ironically, we put in the rational players, and that brought the frequency of the business cycles down into the regime we needed to make the referees happy. We resubmitted the paper and it got published. So yes, you can you can inject certain number of rational players or quasi-rational players, and they can have an important effect on the dynamics. The, the conventional wisdom in economics has been that all you have to do is understand what those guys are doing and everybody else will follow. What you yeah. see when you look at more realistic situations is, because they, they had a, a model for what they called noise trader. A noise trader might do things at random, and then you have the rational players, and the rational players would would effectively there would the noise traders would create some noise around what the rational players did. In fact, what you saw in our model is that was not at all the case. The rational players perturb what the collective players are doing, uh -huh. the other players are doing, and and I think you can have both. Sometimes it'll be like they said. Sometimes it's like what we saw. So it's very rich. And just to, to finish. When you have multiple Nash equilibria is when you tend to see chaotic behavior. The chaotic behavior is a bit like the states are just moving around between the Nash equilibria all the time. The Nash equilibria can be completely lost. They may form a bit of a skeleton of the dynamics, but they're lost otherwise, and the system is blurring over them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not, not a stupid question at all. <laughs> If there is some time, why don't you 
if there are other questions, you were mentioning at the end of your talk uh, these uh, uh, subject related to green economy. That would be interesting to learn about something. Well, well, I don't want to, you know, keep people on the call longer than they want. So people, of course, you can just leave. Those who are interested, we certainly remain here. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So I'm going to share my screen again so I can get my picture here. And then I will play from the, uh, let's see. I'll just push this. All right. So <clears throat> this is a picture of a system we're sort of incrementally building. Since I've been, I started at Oxford now almost 10 years ago, and <clears throat> um, I've had the pleasure of having some extremely good students who find different things to work on. And so we're covering a lot of different bases at a time. And um, also about 10 years ago, I worked in a project where we tried to build a big agent-based model of the economy in one go. Rosario was part of that project. Um, uh, you know, it was really hard and we found it very hard to calibrate it and very hard to estimate parameters. And it was just too much going on at one time. So I've changed the strategy and the strategy is to build separate models. So we have, for example, in the center of this, a model for the production network of the economy um, that, you know, the in one version of the model, the basic nodes of the network are industries. The links are the connections between the industries with weights according to how strong that industry provides input to the other industry. So it's like the production network of how industries buy and sell each other's products. Um, we have a more static version of that and we built a dynamic version of that for COVID actually that allowed us to make a pretty good prediction of how big a hit the British economy would make. In fact, we we beat everybody. We beat the Bank of England, Goldman Sachs. We, were, we, we nailed it. Um, uh, so we put in some agent-based dynamics, but in a simple way. We have a model of the global energy system because we're interested in climate economics. So we've been looking at historical data on progress of different technologies. Um, uh, and we just actually posted a paper uh, last week. The predictions of our paper is that if we do the green energy transition quickly by having renewables really boosting them aggressively, which actually follows existing exponential trends and an increase of renewables, we can do the whole transition in 25 years, less than 25 years, and it actually saves us money relative to where we are now or relative to doing it slowly. Um, so anyway, we have a model for the energy system and how it's going to evolve through time. We've been spending a lot of time looking at patents in the patent space and building network models of patents and innovation. And we now have the model that does the best job of predicting patent rates in specific technology domains by taking into account the citation rates between the domains and uh, building time series models for those. We have a model for the labor market below the module five, where we assume that uh, uh, changing jobs or changing occupations is a kind of earned process. And, um, you know, workers randomly apply to jobs, but they only apply to jobs where they can make transitions. And so we get historical data on which transitions are possible. You know, you can, uh, you can transition, say, from being a physicist to being an engineer. It's not an uncommon transition. Uh, on the other hand, you don't see common transitions from janitor to medical doctor. Um, so, OK, once we know those transitions, we model it as an earned process. We can model labor frictions and see that you get nonlinear behaviors like relations between vacancies and unemployment during business cycles. We can um, we can actually replicate those very well with that model. And we can think about transitions like the green energy transition in particular is the one we're focused on when, where we're gonna change the kind of work that we need because, because we first of all model the shift in the production network for the green energy transition. Uh, so eliminate fossil fuels, put in renewables, that changes all of the supporting industries that feed into those industries and in turn causes changes in the occupational composition, which then we can model that dislocation and whether one creates a bottleneck for the other. Does the fact that we may not have the workers we need, is that going to create a problem in 
and executing the green energy transition. Then, you know, we've also been looking at uh, development questions, green competitiveness. If you're a country, which industries should you support? Which, indus which skills should you be developing so you can be a participant in the green energy transition? And then finally, uh, thinking about investment, we've been thinking about the investment landscape for this, and we've been building a model for the demise of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, you know, progress in renewables, we argue, is going to cause fossil fuels to go out of business. That will be significantly amplified by a carbon tax or regulations, by uh, climate risk getting worse due to things like hurricanes and so on that raise people's consciousness about climate change and uh, due to technology feedbacks, the more renewables, the more we invest in renewables, the faster they improve, the faster they supplant fossil fuels. So uh, this is just the way we're trying to approach putting all the different pieces of the climate economics puzzle together. So um, questions about that, Roberto? Well, <laughs> Probably there would be plenty of questions about that, but I mean, uh, it, it's nice that uh, you did you try to make this sort of multi-layered structure about all these things which are certainly interrelated to each other. Did you you mentioned that this is a recent publication that it concerns a recent project for a publication? Uh, a publication. We had a public. Well, it's a actually a preprint we released with our results. We've submitted, uh -huh. but you know, it represents actually for me a decade of work. Uh -huh. trying to gather data about technological change, which is a surprisingly poorly documented and poorly understood subject. What are is the factors it, that actually cause some technologies find, to improve really fast and others slowly? What did you say? Can we find these paper on the archive or somewhere? Yeah, or? well, it's not in the archive. You have to go to the, uh, the website for the Institute of New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin okay. School. Okay. But if you do that, you'll immediately see it. I'm sure it's featured on the website. Okay. okay. And if you have Thank any you. problems, of course, email me and I'll If I have questions, I first want to read it and then I'll send you some questions by email. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank That'd you. Be great. By the way, are there other questions from the audience? Well, it seems no, we have no more questions, so. OK, uh, OK, I would like to thank you again very much because it was really very, very interesting talk. And I think that all of the participants profited a lot about your uh, speech and uh, hopefully, as I wrote to you last time, we will see again in person in the near future. I yeah, I have to say just just to thank you very much, Roberto. I, I